Welcome to the Take 92 Podcast. My name is Sammy Warmhands. I am your host. And today I'm speaking with one of my favorite songwriters in punk, Yotam Ben Horan from Useless ID. Now, I first came across these guys through Fat Records a few years back. We're going to talk about them working with producers like Tony Sly from No Use, Chris Rowe from the Ataris, Bill and Jason at the Blasting Room, as well as his solo material. All the way from Israel, this is Yotam Ben Horan. Yo. I dig the space. I like the Allroy poster in the background. Thank you. I set it up when COVID started. Yeah. You know, like, because um, I started doing all of these live shows on Facebook. So I realized that the background matters. <laughs> yeah, for sure. This has been my recording studio for like 15 years right here in my house. And uh, I'm also a, a Batman collector. And so, oh, yeah, I see o- that. Over, well, over the years, I've had to take down all my music shit because I ran out yeah. of space for it. And so now it looks like the Batcave, but it's still for recording, you know. What's your favorite Batman movie? The 89, for sure. Oh, that's the first one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I grew yeah. up on, you know. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking about it, and the only connections I have with Israel are right here. Useless ID and Wonder oh. Woman. <laughs> and Wonder Woman, yeah. I lived in Tel Aviv for a while, so I before she became like a big, big star, I used to see her just like, I, I used to pass by her house because the gym I used to work out at was on like, between where I lived and the gym, I always passed by her house. But, huh. So I used to see her a lot in the street and just whatever. That's cool. My girlfriend doesn't believe me. She's like, you didn't see Wonder Woman. I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, this is my first international uh, episode, so that's cool. I was hoping yeah. that we could get this connection thing to work, so I'm happy already. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you. Big fan. You too. Yeah, thank <laughs> um, you. I'm glad we could pull this off. You know, I credit Jason for that since I, I saw you share the interview uh, where we talked yeah, about... I loved it those records and i was like oh shit he listened to the show that's awesome i'd love to talk to him before i forget i wrote down you posted today on instagram that you had a brief hardcore side project in the early 2000s well what is that story yeah this was after no vacation from the world useless id's second actual kung fu record yeah we recorded it i don't think we it was released yet but we just got back from like um one and a half months in Europe, four, four months in the U.S. or something like that. It was like Warp Tour and then record an album. And like we recorded that album and I was just like, I'm fucking done. I, I need to go home. I'm like, if you know, you just feel like homesick and you just beat down from the road and all that. Yeah. But before that, I had this band called DPA, Dr. Pepper Addicts. <laughs> and uh, we pretty much played our last show before that tour, like um, before Useless set out on the journey. And um, I had written like two or three more songs with the buddy that was in that band with me. And I just left, you know, I just, uh, and when I came back, there was a band and I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> they wanted to play a show. So I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll play guitar. I mean, I, I wrote some of these songs. Yeah. It was called 30 Days of Fair because it was a band that lasted one month. <laughs> so. And they actually uh, made a record out of it? They had, like a four song EP. Okay. It was just like very brief. I know what you mean. I, I, I had a side project like that once, man, almost 20 years ago, where it was like just really getting into like Strike Anywhere and Rise Against and that like melodic hardcore that was coming out in like the early, early 2000s and put together a lineup, wrote songs, worked it out. To this day, I couldn't tell you what happened. We never even played a show. Um, <laughs> but like somewhere there are notebooks with those songs written in them. I just don't. I don't know what happened. It was called No Laughing Matter. You, maybe you should revisit. Maybe there's like a hidden gem. Yeah, could be. I mean, sadly, when you're doing like, you know, political punk, uh, a lot of that shit is even more relevant now than ever. So it's sadly yeah, timeless. Yeah, so I don't know if I talked about it on the Jason Livermore interview. or I, I don't know if you heard I did one with Bill a year before that. Yeah, I heard that one as well. Okay, yeah. I, I, I'm sure we talked about you on that too, but it's been a long time. But I was familiar with you guys basically in name only. You know, I had a couple of comps, you know, like short music for short people or Rock Against Bush and, you know, a couple of things. So I like, 
I knew who you guys were, but I was just some years back, like probably 2013, skimming through the Fat Wreck YouTube channel, seeing like, you know, who they got signed these days? What's coming out? I'm so out of the loop. You know, I like I'm I'm a punk rocker, but I'm also a rapper. And so for a lot of years that dominated my focus. And um, I came across one of the videos for Symptoms and I was like, how did I not pay these guys more mind? Oh, this is fucking incredible. And I just immediately went to my local record store and bought that album. You know, since then, you guys have been in constant rotation. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, with Useless ID, like even before I joined the band, like the main focus was pretty much to be a fat records band. Yeah. When I was just hanging out at their rehearsals, you know, they were a band already and I was like 15 or 16 years old. So on one of the drives home, guy who, who had a car because he's a few years older so he told me uh yeah i'm gonna finish my army services and then i'm getting the fuck out of here and like these are the bands we're influenced by and he's like down by law dag nasty no effects screeching weasel I'm, I'm i'm like you know remembering these bands and he was like yeah, yeah and we want to be on fat records we want to be a fat records band and then I, I joined like two years later and it's like for most of our career we were always putting out a record and trying to signed to fat yeah <laughs> and even when we were on kung fu we like let them hear it and then it became like a thing because our name is very like close to no use for a name yeah right away they started associating us with no use for a name and those guys were great and you know tony was a friend and and they clearly influenced us but um at the end of the day it was like well we have already one no use for a name we don't need another one from <laughs> israel <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> even after we finished with Kung Fu. We, we gave Fat Mike uh, the lost broken bones. And he was like, this still sounds like no use. And we we're like, oh, Dustin, it's harder. <laughs> and so with Symptoms, the album that they actually decided to release, we were all like, what the hell is going on? This is our slowest album. This is like a yeah. rock record. They were like, yeah, we love it. And so it, it's funny with the name Useless ID because... Some bands have like a certain identity, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know Propaganda, you're not going to start playing pop punk love songs. Yeah. Propaganda is Propaganda, you're a Green Day, like the shirt you're wearing. Yes. So right away you associate that with the band's image and the band's sound and all that. And for us, since we're influenced by so many things, uh, I don't think we were ever able to say, okay, let's just do this one thing and that's what we do because we love so many things and it's like even beyond punk. It's not like uh, we have one leader and the rest of the band is behind and let's go. Yeah. We're all like these like, you know, different personalities that once we get in a room together, we do useless ID. So we just drop that whole like identity thing. I guess, I guess in a way, like the name speaks for itself. We're just <laughs> like, look at me. I'm wearing a Green River shirt. I love the Seattle stuff, but that's like uh, sometimes it's a big no-no and in punk rock <laughs> yeah i know what you mean i mean I, i've had projects where we sort of embrace all as bill would say and yeah. we just kind of throw everyone's influences in one i have other projects where it's like you know my hardcore band we branched out a bit and found that that didn't work for that project and so now it's like yeah. you know we know what to keep and what to throw out and it's like we're called dead fucking serious it should sound yeah. like that sounds, you know? And so yeah. we kind of threw out all the uh, other influences, like, oh, that's too melodic, that's too metal, that's too whatever. And, um, you know, it works for that project. But uh, it, it's great when you have, you know, the chemistry with everybody, that there's a certain freedom in experimentation and just kind of doing what you're feeling at the time, you know? Yeah, for sure. And... Um after we released Symptoms, even though it got all that uh, feedback and was released on FAT, we quickly realized that we're not playing much of these songs live. Oh. I mean, I like that album. It holds many of my relationship problems of the time. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what we songwriters do. Like, some of us don't have a problem to revisit that and sing about it because, you know, a song takes a life of its own. But we realized that we play only like one or two songs at each show. So for the next record, State is Burning, we were like, you know what? Maybe we should kind of listen to these old fat records bands and old bad religion records and like kind of like dig into what got us into this style of music in the first place because we enjoy playing the fast stuff live. 
Yeah. So we did State is Burning, which is, uh, that's an album I'm more proud of than Symptoms. It's just like, if Symptoms was focused on like this one thing and like it had like a certain sound, State is Burning is like all hell breaks loose, you know, politics and love and personal shit and like growing up and getting older. So it's like dealing with all these things. That That's what I like about records that it it has many emotions, you know? <laughs> it's funny. I mean, we're kind of getting already to the recent shit, but, um, to me, I would say Symptoms is a perfect album. Every song is perfectly on brand, right? The sequencing is great. The production is phenomenal. Everything just flows from top to bottom, right? And yet, State is Burning is the one I prefer because <laughs> it's so, like, it's a little more all over the place, right? Stylistically, but... Yeah it just grabs you by the throat right out of the gate. And to be honest, when it came out, I pushed play on the first song and I was, <laughs> I was like, did I click the wrong band? You know, cause all I had was symptoms. Right. And so I was like, yeah, like I've played this other album a hundred times. I'm in love with it. Right. I know it through and through and I'm, and I'm, I'm don't recognize your voice. I don't think this is <laughs> right. And so after like, 20 seconds or something, I skipped to the next song. And I'm like, what? Did, is something wrong here? What the fuck? And then the, like the chorus came in or something. I was like, oh, shit. They can do this? And <laughs> I just yeah. fucking flipped. And I, again, instantly I actually went to the record store. And it was the same day that Blink-182 dropped California. And I went there. Oh, I was yeah. excited to get both of them. They were like, oh, no, we have the vinyl for this today. The CD comes out next week. I'm like, uh, all right, I guess I'll see you next week. And so I played Blink for a minute, and then I went back the next week, and that album has been on repeat ever since. Like, Again, I, it surprised me because I didn't know you guys had that fiery, hardcore side in you. I love the short, fast, intense stuff, and yet it's hooky without feeling like you're shifting gears mid-song and doing something drastically different it still felt natural you know yeah like 45 seconds right 45 <laughs> seconds that's the kind of shit that i like actually play myself where i was like yes more hard fast but it still got the melody and i don't know i'm rambling now but i fucking just that album took me by surprise and i i really fell in love with it i listened to it a lot actually when i was writing for dfs so nicely done <laughs> thank you thank you it was two different like a uh, work ethics let's say because in symptoms we were missing songs we were like uh a week before flying to the blasting room and we had like 10 songs and i'm like i better get fucking finished writing this record so <laughs> i wrote normal with you in that week and then i wrote fear in the mirror we didn't have lyrics it just had like a melody line and we just wrote it with bill in the studio like uh, just melodies and everything and with status burning i had also set out on my own journey as a like a solo artist i feel like that made me better at everything like better vocally and it made me a better lyricist as well because the lyrics on state is burning they're more like expanding you know on symptoms it was like that one thing that kind of like took over the record which i'm fine with but for years fat mike always told us you guys are from israel it's like one of the most fucked up places in the world why don't you write about like yeah. political stuff I'm, I'm sure something's happening I mean it's not like you're just having <laughs> girl problems yeah so we kind of took that to heart and with symptoms I was very on top of like the whole uh, production even though Bill and Jason were producing I was staying up like you know we finished recording during the days and then I would stay up like till 2 a.m. listening to the songs in room A with a guitar and trying to write lead guitar parts. I was like pretty much killing myself over that record. And then the next day, Ishai, the guitar player, he would have a few ideas. So we'd see like which one worked better. And for State is Burning, I'm like, I don't even want to get into it. I'm just going to write songs, <laughs> many of them. I set out to write 40 songs before. Uh, wow. Before, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't know what to write about. I was like, this is before like the whole political thing hit me. I was like, I, I don't know like what we could do. And then I had a chat with the guys. I'm like, all right, so if we write 40 songs or if I write 40 songs, 10 of them will be good for sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you go, 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 go. So that's pretty much what happened. 
I had a, a batch of 40 songs. I went on my, my journey. Uh, some of those 40 songs became my solo record. And when I was back from spending a half a year in the States alone, we continued writing the record. And, I, and then I was inspired. I, I saw so many things on the road. And, you know, the situation in Israel wasn't getting any better. And I was like, these things matter to me now. I can write about them. So, yeah, that was a process, that album. And the guys took their own lead on writing the lead guitar parts that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so it was cool. It was cool. We were like, Let, let's make this a band thing. Let's not, like, you know, one guy take control and, like, because uh, that's what a band's about at the end of the day, you know. I'm going to play bass. You guys play your guitars. Figure it out. Yeah, and I, I can hear that. The last record sounds very much like a band in a room, you know? And yeah. I feel like with Symptoms, it's all the blasting room stuff. You know, it's, it's all of it. It's <laughs> yeah. ve very produced, and I love it. It's one of their best-sounding records. Oh, wow. You know, you. sonically, I'm obsessed with it. But again, ever since it came out, though, State is Burning, it's just got that fucking, like, mm! I mean, it opens with a fucking scream. <laughs> and the and the <laughs> snare like hits and the snare hits counting in it. Yes, exactly. Like minor threat, man. It's yeah. just uh, wow. You know, I had a similar experience in putting out a record that was very personal. And like you were saying, when you're out performing the songs, it's like maybe I'm writing about some shit where I've now made amends with these people. I've put this shit behind me. Like the stuff that yeah. I'm trying to get off my chest is no longer stuff that I want to perform and. Part of it, too, was just like I felt this shit was coming to such a boiling point that I almost like had to say something, you know, like it would be crazy for me to not speak on things at this point. Like, who cares about my problems, you know? Yeah. Like you were saying, you kind of change your perspective lyrically and brought in a political point of view on that record, you know? So it's like you had the more yeah. personal stuff, you know, you can only talk about yourself when the world is burning down all around you before you start to go like man we need to change the conversation <laughs> yeah because i wouldn't consider myself the political person of the band because yeah. that's kind of guy's area he was and he still is always like involved politically in what's going on he always knows what's going on but for me the last few years there's like no way around it because for you guys trump became president yeah. for us. Well, I, I don't live here much, but when I am in Israel, there's one prime minister that he's been the prime minister for fucking ever, you know? Yeah. And now there's protests outside his house during the era of COVID. Yeah. And people don't give a shit. They're like, we want this guy out. We want this guy out because people are without jobs. Many, many are unemployed. The shops are closing. Israel's becoming like one mean place you know like it's 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 hard it's a struggle here so i i can't just like sit in my room and write about well i i don't have girl problems now because i'm pretty <laughs> like i'm pretty much half married at this point <laughs> but yeah if only life would allow that you know what i mean she, yeah. she's in italy but um of course we have our stuff and i write sometimes i write about what we go through or sometimes i write about her but that's not the case here like there's something bigger happening in the world right now Whoever avoids it is, I, you know what I mean? You can't. Yeah. I, I don't understand people who just say, you know what? I, I don't care about this, but whatever. No, this is what's happening in this whole planet right now. There's a fucking pandemic and we're all dealing with it and we all have to deal with it and we all have to survive. It's like being thrown into sea, like, okay, survive, go. Yeah. That, that's, what, that's what it feels like. So you can't just ignore it. You ignore it, you die. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know it's i don't simple. care about the shark behind me i'm just gonna chill here <laughs> yeah i get that it is um for a lot of people myself included you know shit could be really overwhelming to constantly be you know watching the the news cycle and having those conversations and so i get unplugging for a minute but like i remember seeing something that was like if you ever thought to yourself you know what would you do during the Holocaust? What would you do during the Civil Rights Movement? What would you do, you know, in all these times? It's like, well, you're doing it now. Now is what you would do. <laughs> so make sure yeah. that that holds up to your own moral compass, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm even crazier in that sense. Every time I see, like, a 
there's these videos going around about people abusing animals that mm. it, it just destroys me because right away I put myself in the victim's uh, perspective. Like, what is that animal feeling? And like, why are these people doing it? Yeah. That's one of the saddest things for me to see. Yeah, I, I just lose my shit over this stuff. Yeah, man, the world's a cruel place. I totally back the idea of finding little spots in the day to kind of like detach yourself from this madness because once you're in it, it's hard to get out. You know, once you start scrolling on Facebook, then that leads to another thing, then that leads to someone's opinion, then that leads to an argument, and then you're like, holy shit, it's 5 p.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? No shit, I, I had to delete my uh, Facebook app a couple of times since the pandemic because it was just like so much fucking negativity you know like oh, i can get the information without the commentary okay i'm good <laughs> exactly dude so i do want to talk about uh some of your your journey I, I like to dig into the discography a bit and what i've understood is that you guys were quote unquote sort of discovered in terms of american exposure by chris rowe I know you hit, had that split together, but um, how did you guys first cross paths? Well, uh, when Atari's put out, what's that album called? Anywhere But Home? Yeah, Anywhere But Here, maybe? No, Anywhere But Here. Yeah. Yeah, Anywhere But Home, I think that's something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they put that album out. We really loved it, because to us, it, it was like, holy shit, another band like Green Day. Because we, we were into that, like, lookout pop punk back then. Yeah. So... When we were in the States and we just started touring, that this was like the second tour. Like the, the first tour I, I wasn't a part of because I was still in school, yeah, like in high school. And the guys just like went off on their journey. So this was the second time. So we already had a van and all that. So we were driving around. We had this show at the old Ironsides with the Teen Idols. Remember that band? Mm -hmm. And then we had to drive to, I think it was the Coca Tree or something. And when we got to the entrance, we saw like this list of bands on a, on a board and the Atari's was written there and it was scratched out. So I'm like, holy shit, holy shit, fuck, we missed the Atari's. And as I'm saying this, this guy walks out holding an amp and I'm like, hey, dude, did the Atari's play? Like, are, are they playing? He's like, uh, yeah, we just played. I, we are the Atari's. Oh, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we just started chatting it up because I think we were last on that build with like, it was us and uh, Sweet Diesel. So, yeah, we just started chatting it up. And then uh, the bass player, Mike, comes out. And, and he's like, oh, cool. Let, let's give you guys some CDs and stuff. And so I think we had like a cassette tape of our To Be record. Uh, that's not punk. Yeah. I don't think we had copies of it yet. I think it was, we had a cassette of it. So we just gave Chris the cassette. He gave us uh, some Atari stuff. And I think he sent Ishai an email. Ishai was the email guy. I was like, I, this was like 1998. Yeah. This was 1998. So like, I think when the whole email craze just started. So Ishai was doing all these emails. So he, we got an email one day and I think Chris suggested, uh, he proposed, let's do a seven inch together. Let's do a split together. Cause I like your, I like your band. I like uh, your guys' sound and uh, I'm going to let Joe hear this. And so it kind of like started rolling from there. That's rad, man. And, that was another one where I got into them on Blue Skies. Like, I, I knew that record existed, but I didn't actually have their first couple releases. <laughs> and so uh, another one of me just, like, barely missing you guys over the years. Um, but he led you to Kung Fu, right? Was that split on Kung Fu? Yeah, that split was on Kung Fu. And that split did very well at the time. I think it's, like, for... Uh indie label i think it sold like seventy thousand, and we were like that's awesome because <laughs> i think we were used to selling like uh a hundred locally back yeah. then you know <laughs> just going on the road and, hey that's what i know. do man i'll press up 200 yeah. of them go on a couple short tours sell out of them and move on Dude, to the next record i, I still sell a hundred locally you know that yep <laughs> yep so uh yeah so eventually that led to doing a record for kung fu but the interesting thing is that from uh, the split to the record itself, the band kind of changed. Yeah. Like, I brought in songs and I started singing and Guy did less of the vocal duties because he was the original singer. At the time, Joe wasn't sure that he, he was like, is this good? Like, I, I was expecting the useless ID from the split. And Chris yeah. was like, 
it's great. You got to trust me. I'm going to produce it. Don't worry. It's going to be great. So he convinced Joe. Joe and, Escalante uh, yeah. from the Vandals. Joe Escalante from the Vandals. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was a funny beginning. That's cool, man. I mean, what a gesture, not just to be like, wow, I like these guys. Let's do a fucking split. But then to witness your growing pains and still vouch for you enough to be like, no, we're, we're carrying you with us on the label. Like, we're going to make this right. And, and I mean, he produced the record, right? Yeah, he produced the record. We've done several tours with them. And even to this day, he's one of my good friends in the U.S. Like, we're always in touch. If I'm in the area, we always meet up and drive around and talk about music and listen to podcasts and, you know, shoot the shit, as they say. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome, so, man. Yeah. Yeah, Chris Rowe is... Uh, is a very dear guy in, in the useless ID camp. He actually opened the door for us. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, we probably continued touring back then, but to meet him and then be on Kung Fu Records and and suddenly, and then in 2002, we did that whole Warp Tour, like, which I mentioned before. So it's like, yeah, things were happening. I could say sort of that I opened for the Ataris, kind of. One time... Uh, my band played the like the local stage at the Warp Tour, and we were the first band of the whole day, and we're yeah. we're packing up, walking off stage, and I swear to God, I can hear the uh, the Ataris, but it's like so long Astoria era. They were huge, they were all over yeah. the radio, and I'm like, that can't be right, and I'm listening, I'm like, that's live. This is not house music, <laughs> and so yeah. we throw all our shit in the car and we run over to the main stage. And sure enough, they're opening the main stage. I'm like, what is happening right now? Chris tells his story on stage between songs. He's like, yeah, so um, you're probably wondering why we're playing at 1130 in the morning. Um, <laughs> he's like, yesterday we had some hecklers and things got out of hand. I might have pulled my dick out on stage. <laughs> and I was like, what? 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 fuck and he said something about like flashing somebody i don't know if they were throwing shit or what but he's like things got really out of hand i apologize to kevin lyman and we agreed that we would if he would not kick us off that we would open for as long as he wants and i was like that wow. is nuts so this is a probably 17 year old me remembering this so if i got anything wrong i apologize but it was <laughs> it was wild that I did not expect for them at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now that you tell this story, I wouldn't expect it either. But sometimes a, a band reaches a point where it's like, as you say, they were that huge and that big that I, I think you kind of get lost in, in yeah. your own reality. It's like you, you're you in this different reality. I'm, I just started watching this uh, movie I've been meaning to watch for like a zillion years already. It's uh, about Tom Petty running down a dream. You know that? It's, it's a four-hour documentary of Damn. Tom Petty. So I, I made it like to an hour and a half. But you see how uh, life around him just changes and people start acting different. And and he's aware of like, all right, let's see how long this could last because you're on top of the world. You have no control. He says you have no control over success. And that kind of struck me when he said that. Like, yeah. Once you're in success, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't have any control of like the people like, the stopping you on the street or like the young people in their 20s that make it big suddenly get like a, a check for a hundred grand that's a problem you know yeah. <laughs> that's irresponsible what was i reading it might have been the bad religion book yeah i think it was the bad religion book when they were on atlantic that graffin had negotiated for like a lower advance because they had been around and they they weren't poor they were okay yeah but negotiated like a lower advance for a higher royalty you know so they wouldn't have that fucking problem it's like now nah, we can eat i want to make sure that we can eat off this long term though you know not be like yeah. blowing a big record advance right out the gate yeah i didn't read that book yet i can't get a hold on it <laughs> oh really yeah it's really good yeah. i i just read that and the new Sick of It All book, and the new, uh, well, it's not new anymore, but new to me, uh, by Flea from the Chili Peppers. Oh, I love, I love that one. Flea is great. I'm simultaneously enjoying it, but also, like, 
I'm very, very close to the end. I'm like 350 pages in, and the, the band hasn't formed yet. And I'm like, wait, they're not going to talk about it at all. I didn't realize that. No. So it's not it, scar it, tissue. It gives a bit of like hints on Hillel and who who Hillel was, and a lot of Anthony. But the band is like just forming, and then the story ends. Yeah, uh, I haven't even heard <laughs> the name John Frusciante or Chad Smith or anything yet. So I was kind of bummed once I got that far along. I was like, okay, I'm on page two hundred. He just bought a bass. I'm like, well, yeah. this is going to be one of those where. You know, a lot of books, they'll spend so much time on their formative years in the beginning. And then they'll kind of gloss over the later decades of, like, the albums I wanted to read about, you know? Yeah. And then as it's going further and further, I'm like, nope, they're just not going to come up. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> it's still fun. That was his vision for that book, just to kind of capture the essence and the imagery and the whole, like, air of his childhood in, like, yeah. um, L.A. In the, in the 70s. And I think he did a great job. I'm a bookworm, dude. Yeah, I, I read so many books. I finished a, I recently finished a book about Boy George, 500 pages. And then, yeah, and then I finished uh, Mark Lanigan, you know, from Screaming Trees. No, actually, I don't. You should check it out. A lot of stories about uh, Lane Staley and Kurt Cobain and drugs. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, yeah I love I, all I, that I'm, behind the scenes stuff, man. I just actually my second book is being a. Uh, Read at the label right now. Just waiting for them to send notes on the last hundred pages. I'm really excited. Oh, cool. What, what did you write about? My first book was uh, every chapter was an album I'd made. And it was sort of, um, it was punctuated that way, but it was kind of just my whole story from, you know, garage punk rock to touring as a rapper and having, you know, a DIY label and stuff like that. And then mm -hmm. this, this new one, it's called How to Ruin Your Life. And it's all about the terrible grind that is DIY touring. It's yeah. set up as like um, like a day in the life. I went through like spreadsheets and social media photos and hard drives and anything I could find to um, basically piece together all this shit from you know the past tours and and actually try to take it through as if it was kind of a journal written at the time. So. It took forever, but uh, I'm stoked with it. Cool. Yeah, you know, now that you're mentioning that you release books and you're working on a book, I'm doing the same. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I started, uh, I've been keeping journals pretty much since that Atari's tour that I mentioned. But, oh, wow. Yeah, it really stabilized in like, uh, I think in like 2005. I was like, sometimes writing, sometimes not. You know, and I had this kind of like childhood in, in New York that to me... Like now, as an adult, thinking back at it, I'm trying to make sense of many things that happened in my childhood. Yeah. And I'm sure many people do that. So I just started writing about it, and then I started editing these journal entries into, like, stories. And, yeah, it's been three years now that I'm, that I'm on it, and I take very long breaks from it. I have, like, I think eight more chapters to write, yeah. and then it'll be a first draft. I don't know, maybe I should let you read some. Yeah, man, I'd love to. It's it, it takes a long time, for sure. My first one, I just really put my nose to the grindstone, and I wrote the whole thing in six weeks because I would just wow. I would just sit down for like eight hours a day and just grind it out. I want to do that. Yeah, that was easier for that one, just given the, like, I'm basically just kind of telling my whole story. The other one was way harder because it was just so much research of like, okay, we were in Santa Cruz. i trying to even fucking picture. And I'd be texting my tour mates going like, yo, do you have any photos from, 2012, <laughs> from 2012 when we were out in the, you know? And so it took fucking forever. I think I'm going to need to pick your brain maybe outside of the show because just For so sure. the listeners don't get bored with us talking about how to write, how to write a book. Well, yeah, I mean, but, I, I don't really mind on the show because it's all just anything nerdy, you know, like when I've had producers on, they're like, are you sure you want me to talk about gear? I'm like, yes, just bring, <laughs> yeah. you know. I mean, we could talk about gear as well, but um, so once you're done with the draft, who edits it? How how's that work? Are, do you... Well, I did my first one, and I just did a super short run because I didn't think anyone would really care, and um, okay. it actually sold out, and so having it in my hand, I realized I fucked up a lot, <laughs> and so okay. I re-edited it and pressed a bunch more, and um, wow. 
then uh, with the new one, I decided I didn't want that to happen again. And so I had a friend who was a grad student who was really keen on doing it, but he he had it for like six months and never did anything. So I instead edited it myself multiple times where like I printed it out a hard copy because if I don't do that, then you're just playing and rewriting and whatever. Yeah, yeah. But if I'm just grading it like a paper, then there's only so much I can do. And then I went through the whole thing from scratch in the computer, just making those changes and make sure the formatting is all right and photos are lined up and stuff. And then once I was like, all right, I'm 100% sure it's done, I asked the manager at my label, Crush Kill, and I'm so glad that I did because I fucked up so many times and I thought it was perfect. So, you know, you just get so... uh, Wrapped up. Yeah, I mean, when you're doing it for hours and hours and hours, just staring at the screen, it's like, especially if I'm rewriting, and it's like, oh, I'm going to move this over here. Oh, I'm going to take that out. I'm going to add to this. You know, then it'll be like, you can tell where I did an edit or I'd say the same word twice or something or missed a, a capitalization or just some little minor thing that I overlooked. So I'm really glad that I had someone I trusted who could just go through and, and just look for the grammatical stuff that I overlooked. Cool. Yeah. It's quite a process. Um, I, I know what you mean. I'm always remembering like these more stories. So I'm writing like the name of the story down on the side just so I have that. And then I'm like, where can I place this? Do, do I even need this? Is this part of the story? Is this? Yeah, man. So, it's definitely a different experience. But, and I think the podcast helps me too because I will spend, you know, if I have an hour long show, I will sit down with that episode for about three hours. And I'll cut out when we just sit there and, um, well, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and just naturally the way that humans speak, right? If you prompt me something for me to answer you, I will say, oh yeah, that time we, um, that time, uh, <laughs> the time that we went to the zoo, right? And so I started that sentence three times. And so I am now in the habit of hearing speech and editing it. It's in my head Oh, nice! because I've been doing this show for five years now. So like, it's just helps me think like that. So it also helped me edit the book in that it's just a different kind of analytical skill, you know. So I want to talk a little bit uh, just about your uh, work with the Blasting Room. We touched on it, but, um, you know, how did you get in touch with those guys? Uh, What was that experience like? I've had a lot of their bands on the show and and talked to both Bill and Jason, and, you know, I'm just a huge fan of their stuff. And whenever I see that name on a record, it's a uh, pretty good sign that I'm going to give it a chance, you know? Yeah, so with Kung Fu, we were about to make our last record. And for each record, they give you a different budget. So by the third record and our last record for the label, it was like kind of a three and a half with the split CD. Yeah. But this was going to be our last record. And we were like, what's going to happen with the band now? Like, where are we going to go? We, it was like out into the open again. So we were thinking like who should we should record with. And Audio Karate just made a record at the Blasting Room, and uh, we were hearing such great things that Bill's a great producer, and of course we were all fans of Descendants and All and Black Flag, and and also fans of records he released through the Blasting Room. Yeah. Even Atari's uh, End Is Forever, I think they recorded there, and Lagwagon did some stuff there. So we're like, if we could record at the Blasting Room, let's do it now, because we don't know what's going to happen. And then, it was kind of love at first sight, I I mean, maybe not for Bill. (laughs) Maybe not for Bill and Jason, but for us, we were like, oh my God, it's amazing here. You know, just walking through the halls and seeing all those records, we were just mind blown. And then when we started working on the record, we did a bit of pre-production and we recorded a demo at the studio. It was like a whole new experience for us because we were just used to preparing our songs, sometimes coming with like, you know, acoustic demos and yeah just mapping it out at the studio and recording it. With them, it was a whole different process. And Bill changed six of the vocal registers of the songs, like, you know, six keys. He's like, you're singing too low, let's raise this. You're singing too low, let's... And he, in a way, he helped me find my voice. I started noticing that I sound better here. I sound like I'm struggling here. I sound like shit here. Yeah, that's great. I, I remember Ryan Green saying something like that with no effects, that they were doing... I think it was Heavy Petting Zoo. And he was like, yeah. oh, 
you're doing something different with the vocals here. Like, you know, at practice, the song was really hitting, you know, like something's not quite right. And then after they figured it out, it was like, oh, you guys recorded this in a different key? And so he made them yeah. re-record it in the other key, and then the vocals sounded perfect. It's like, yes. Dude, it's very important. Now, now for me, it's second nature. If I'm writing a song, e even if I write it in a place that's not going to eventually be uh, the, the key that it's in, I, I, know, I know where to take it. If it's, if it's a band song, I know it should be here. Like, I, I, I gave an example of that. A while ago, I was doing these online songwriting lessons. Nice. Speaking of being thrown into the deep end and surviving, so that's <laughs> yeah. one of the things I did. So, yeah, so I was giving them an example of that. We already kind of talked about uh, the last couple records. I do also want to talk about your solo stuff. I was this close to seeing you live last year um, yeah. on the, the Good Riddance tour. I was bummed that uh, you couldn't be there. Us too. Then you were doing some solo dates, and what I didn't realize was uh, that you actually had solo albums out. You kind of mentioned that earlier, that you had used, I won't say leftovers, but other songs you had written around the time of, like, State is Burning, that, oh, yeah, these are more suited for my solo stuff. Well, it started kind of, like, low profile in Israel in around 2009, where I wrote this, like, indie rock song on an acoustic guitar. And I knew that wasn't going to be useless ID, so I tried to form a band. And that band just lasted a few rehearsals. And I was like, I really like this song. I'll just post it on MySpace, you know, yeah. just my demo. And I got all these, like, responses back, and people liked it. You know, not that many people, was it? But I got all this feedback from people. This is so nice. You should write another acoustic song. So I just started writing acoustic songs. But the whole solo thing really took off for me and really started being a part of my life when I just quit everything in late 2014 and just said, I'm going one-way ticket to the U.S., anything goes. I had all the all these songs that we had tried in the Useless ID rehearsals and kind of like, they didn't sound to us like the next Useless ID, so I just kept like a bank of songs on the side. Yeah. And when I set out to play shows, I didn't want to play my first solo record, like the indie rock stuff. I had this like, inner scream inside me that wanted to come out i was like kind of fed up and i wanted to sing and i wanted like to hit the acoustic guitar so i couldn't like just stand there and play all these like soft tunes so i just started playing the useless id demos that didn't make the status burning uh the pre-status burning cut and eventually i just went into the studio uh flying blanket studios where chris rowe from the ataris also does some recordings in uh, arizona and just recorded for two days and made my California Sounds album with Bob, that's, the guy that runs. That's great, man. I, I actually just came across that the other day as I was kind of prepping for this interview and listened to uh, some tracks I found on YouTube. I I thought it was really nice. You had a dedication to Tony Sly. I'm also yeah. a big fan of his, uh, not just of No Use. I mean, Leshek and Carney was the first fat release that I ever had, you know, so like I've, I've loved those dudes forever, but... His solo records, in particular, are really, really special to me, and and I think he's probably my favorite songwriter, e even just to, in terms of singer songwriter stuff. And so it was, it was really nice to hear that. We talked a little bit about the comparison, but I mean, what was your experience with with Tony and No Use? Well, first of all, as you mentioned, Leche Con Carne, that was one of the first fat records I listened to as well, and I had actually seen the video for Soulmate in like late 95 yeah me and a buddy we were just watching uh what was that show called on mtv like 120 it minutes it was either alternative nation or headbangers ball one of oh, okay. these and suddenly that came up and at the time we were already into like green day and we discovered no effects and that whole like colorful pop punk thing that was going on you know it was very colorful back then it wasn't it was before like the whole like dark gothic vibe took over for a while yeah before everybody became batman you know <laughs> <laughs> so that was like the vibe so then we see this band you know with backwards hat and one of the guy has like purple hair or whatever and they're playing like this style of music that we love so like hit record hit record so yeah that was that was my first encounter with noise for a name so from then on Every time they put a record out, that just sent me off to write a bunch of songs of my own. And No Use at the End became a very big influence. So in 2002, 
when we were looking for a producer for uh, no, our album No Vacation, we hit up a few people at the Warp Tour. And when we hit up Tony, he was just so cool about it. He goes, yeah, I like you guys. Um, Joe sent me uh, your record, and I'd love to produce you. So wow. that started this bromance on tour between me and Tony, <laughs> where I'd go to the No Use bus almost every other day and just work on songs with him for like 40 minutes. That's a and dream, just, man. That's so great. Yeah, yeah. he would share his uh, ideas and tricks as you may call it, like, you know, the first meeting I had with him before going through songs or anything, he just presented me with a tape recording. He said, tomorrow we're going to be at Walmart. You got to get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's where I started like obsessively recording myself. Cause I was aware of it. I, I had like this four track where I used to like try to like record demos. I was always aware of like, you know, this, uh, how do you call this tape that you know businessmen walk around with for ideas? That oh yeah, like yeah. Back in the day, yeah, yeah, one of those. Like those, things. like those miniature cassettes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was planning on buying one of those, but then Tony just told me all you got to do is buy one of these like Sony tape things. And the funny thing is that when we did our album, I think it was Lost Broken Bones in 2008. People are always leaving stuff at the blasting room, so I saw a tape just like mine. And uh, No Use had just recorded their record before we came in. Nice. They did uh, the Feel Good Record of the Year. So I saw this uh, cassette recorder over there, and there was a tape inside. So I'm like, oh, I wonder what this is. So I pressed, and it was uh, Tony uh, working out songs. Nice. And so the blasting group made kill me, but I, I felt like I had to take it. Oh, it was kind of like okay. a full circle. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I don't think anyone would mind if I take this, and I'll just give it to Tony one day. So sadly, I never gave it to Tony, and I still have that cassette and the tape recorder here. So that's uh, wow. one of the little treasures from life. Yeah. yeah, something you didn't think at the time that uh, I'm sure you're really glad that you have. Yeah, and many things. I also have this CD that Tony gave me that he wrote, TS, Nine Songs. It was uh, his first solo record before it came out, so he made me a copy of it. That's awesome, like, man. Listen, Listen to this. <laughs> I'm, I'm really lucky. We saw them play on uh, my wife's birthday, and he signed my wife's birthday card. And then when the last record came out, Feel Good Record of the Year, Fat had sent a bunch of signed posters with the album cover to local record stores, and I was lucky enough to catch one opening day. And so I, I have that framed on my wall uh, in the nice. living room. Like, uh, yeah, it's so great. I just... I don't have to tell you. He's just a genius songwriter. He makes you feel yeah. everything, you know? So great. Yeah, for me, he's up there with all the greats, you know, with Elliot Smith. Yeah. And such. Enough said, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, definitely. So what have you been working on? Are you writing? I mean, nobody's touring right now, but I mean, it's been a few years since State is Burning and California Sounds. What's up the sleeve? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. Before this pandemic started... We had a useless ID tour in Japan. Mm. So before the Japan tour, I had like a month at home. I was like, I came back from Philadelphia because uh, I was in the U.S. for a while. And I, I was also living at Fat Mike's Compound, Six Flags, if you heard of it. Nice. So I was trying to write a new useless ID record. I was just gathering all these ideas I've written over the years. And then uh, we did Japan. And from Japan, I flew to Thailand for a few weeks because I like to do this uh, Thai boxing. And when I was back in Israel, the whole pandemic started. So I just dropped the whole idea of working on a record and I just focused my energies on seeing my girlfriend. Yeah. Because we were separated or we were about to be separated. Because you know, So I didn't really focus on that. But a bit before that, Fat Mike told me of an idea to put out a Best of Useless ID album. Nice. So some of those songs that I've written... We decided to record them when things freed up a bit in Israel and when nobody was in lockdown and no one had to stay in quarantine. So we recorded a few songs. Those songs are recorded and recorded in Israel, mixed and mastered at the Blasting Room. Oh, great. So that's, that's something to look forward to. So other than that, I've pretty much, I pretty much have another acoustic record ready to go as far as... Uh, material yeah i don't know there's like almost 20 songs and that's just sitting on the side it may be a new tommy and june if you're familiar with that that's like no. the new 
that's the new solo acoustic. It's uh, okay. It's a band that Fat Mike put together. Me and Johnny from Old Man Markley. All right. So it's, it's you check it out. It's very reminiscent of what I do solo, but there's a added instrumentation. Oh, cool. So there's enough for that. So now I'm like, what am I going to do? So these past few days, I just started writing again, and I haven't written a proper song in like six months. I'm just fucking around. And, and trying to get by and doing a lot of Facebook lives. I overdid the Facebook live and Instagram <laughs> live. So I'm like, I just killed it, dude. I just killed it to the ground. <laughs> so I just started writing new songs and I like them. They're different. They're different from Status Burning. Awesome, man. It's, it's just the very beginning when you write the first few songs of uh, a new project. There could be a few, you know, false attempts where you think you're writing the songs and then you're like, eh, is it good enough or it sounds like something I did? But I feel like this batch of songs, while well, I only have three right now, are kind of like a newer sound for what I'm doing. And so no, no use comparisons here. <laughs> cool, man. Well, uh, sounds like I got plenty to look forward to then. Me too. All right, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. Is there anything uh, that we should have covered that we didn't get around to? I guess uh, look out for the best of Useless ID, which we're still... Uh, thinking of how to name it yeah so many projects i think one of the best things we as artists have is this outlet it saves a lot on therapy sessions yeah and now that there's so much happening in the world there's so much to write about so in a way it's terrible but in a way it's food for what we do all right, that is our show. Thank you guys so much for listening. As always, you can help spread the word just by taking a screenshot, put that to your stories, and uh, you could also give us a five-star rating on iTunes. That'll help get the word out about the show. I've got more guests up the sleeve and our annual top 10 albums of the year coming up. But we're going to close out with a song that I think represents both the mellow and the punk of Yo Tom's work. This is Useless ID, an excellent closer. It's called Detune. Peace.